page 258. Part 2. Cardinal Manifestations and Presentation of Diseases. Chapter 54. Nausea, Vomiting, and Indigestion. Nausea is the subjective feeling of a need to vomit. Vomiting, emesis, is the oral expulsion of gastrointestinal contents due to contractions of gut and thoric abdominal wall musculature. Vomiting is contrasted with regurgitation, the effortless passage of gastric contents into the mouth. Rumination is the repeated regurgitation of food residue, which may be rechewed and re-swallowed. In contrast to emesis, these phenomena may exhibit volitional control. Indigestion is a term encompassing a range of complaints including nausea, vomiting, heartburn, regurgitation, and dyspepsia, the presence of symptoms thought to originate in the gastroduodenal region. Some individuals with dyspepsia report predominantly epigastric burning, gnawing, or pain. Others experience postprandial fullness, early satiety, an inability to complete a meal due to premature fullness, bloating, eructation, belching, and anorexia. Nausea and vomiting. Mechanisms. Vomiting is coordinated by the brainstem and is affected by responses in the gut, pharynx, and somatic musculature. Mechanisms underlying nausea are poorly understood but likely involve the cerebral cortex, as nausea requires conscious perception. This is supported by functional brain imaging studies showing activation of a range of cerebral cortical regions during nausea. Coordination of emesis. Brainstem. Nuclei, including their nucleus tractus solitarius, dorsal, vagal and phrenic nuclei, medullary nuclei regulating respiration, and nuclei that control pharyngeal, facial, and tongue movements. Coordinate initiation of emesis. Neurokinin NK1, serotonin 5-HT3, and vasopressin pathways participate in this coordination. Somatic and visceral muscles respond stereotypically during emesis. Inspiratory, thoracic and abdominal wall muscles contract, producing high intrathoracic and intraabdominal pressures that evacuate the stomach. The gastric cardia herniates above the diaphragm and the larynx moves upward to propel the vomitus. Distally migrating gut contractions are normally regulated by an electrical phenomenon, the slow wave, which cycles at 3 cycles per minute in the stomach and 11 cycles per minute in the duodenum. During emesis, the slow wave is abolished and is replaced by orally propagating spikes that evoke retrograde contractions that assist in expulsion of gut contents. Activators of emesis Emetic stimuli act at several sites. Emesis evoked by unpleasant thoughts or smells originates in the brain, whereas cranial nerves mediate vomiting after gag reflex activation. Motion sickness and in rear disorders act on the labyrinthine system. Gastric irritants and cytotoxic agents like cisplatin stimulate gastroduodenal vagal afferent nerves. Non-gastric afferents are activated by intestinal and colonic obstruction and mesenteric ischemia. The area postma, in the medulla, responds to bloodborne stimuli, emetogenic drugs, bacterial toxins, uremia, hypoxia, ketoacidosis, and is termed the chemoceptor trigger zone. Neurotransmitters mediating vomiting are selective for different sites. Labyrinthine disorders stimulate vestibular muscarinic M1 and histaminergic H1 receptors. Vagal afferent stimuli activate serotonin 5-HT3 receptors. The area postma is served by nerves acting on 5-HT3, M1, H1, and opamin D2 subtypes. Cannabinoid CB1 pathways may participate in the cerebral cortex. Optimal pharmacologic therapy of vomiting requires understanding of these pathways. Differential diagnosis. Nausea and vomiting are caused by conditions within and outside the gut as well as by drugs and circulating toxins. Table 541. Intraperitoneal disorders. Visceral obstruction and inflammation of hollow and solid viscera may elicit vomiting. Gastric obstruction results from ulcers and malignancy whereas small bowel and colon blockage occur because of adhesions, benign or malignant tumors, volvulus, intussusception, 
or inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease. The superior mesenteric artery syndrome, occurring after weight loss or prolonged bed rest, results when the duodenum is compressed by the overlying superior mesenteric artery. Abdominal irradiation impairs intestinal motor function and induces strictures. Biliary colic causes nausea by acting on local afferent nerves. Vomiting with pancreatitis, cholecystitis, and appendicitis is due to visceral irritation and induction of ileus. Enteric infections with viruses like norovirus or rotavirus or bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus often cause vomiting, especially in children. Opportunistic infections like cytomegalovirus or herpes simplex virus induce emesis in immunocompromised individuals. Gut sensory motor dysfunction often causes nausea and vomiting. Gastroparesis presents with symptoms of gastric retention with evidence of delayed gastric emptying and occurs after vagotomy or with pancreatic carcinoma, mesenteric vascular insufficiency, organic diseases like diabetes, sclerodema, and amyloidosis. Idiopathic gastroparesis is the most common etiology. It occurs in the absence of systemic illness and may follow a viral illness, suggesting an infectious trigger. Intestinal pseudobstruction is characterized by disrupted intestinal and colonic motor activity with retention of food residue and secretions, bacterial overgrowth, nutrient malabsorption, and symptoms of nausea, vomiting, bloating, pain, and alter defecation. Intestinal pseudobstruction may be idiopathic, inherited as a familial visceral myopathy or neuropathy, result from systemic disease or occur as a paraneoplastic consequence of malignancy, for example, small cell lung carcinoma. Patients with gastroesophageal reflux may report nausea and vomiting, as do some with irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, or chronic constipation. Other functional gastroduodenal disorders without organic abnormalities have been characterized in adults. Chronic idiopathic nausea is defined as nausea without vomiting occurring several times a week. Functional vomiting is defined as one or more vomiting episodes weekly in the absence of an eating disorder or psychiatric disease. Cyclic vomiting syndrome presents with periodic discrete episodes of relentless nausea and vomiting in children and adults and shows an association with migraine headaches suggesting that some cases may be migraine variants. Some adult cases have been described in association with rapid gastric emptying. A related condition, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, presents with cyclical vomiting with intervening well periods in individuals, mostly men, who use large quantities of cannabis over many years and resolves with its discontinuation. Pathologic behaviors such as taking prolonged hot baths or showers are associated with the syndrome. Rumination syndrome, characterized by repetitive regurgitation of recently ingested food, is often misdiagnosed as refractory vomiting. Extraperitoneal disorders. Myocardial infarction and congestive heart failure may cause nausea and vomiting. Postoperative emesis occurs after 25% of surgeries, most commonly laparotomy and orthopedic surgery. Increased intracranial pressure from tumors, bleeding, abscess, or blockage of cerebrospinal fluid outflow produces vomiting with or without nausea. Patients with psychiatric illnesses including anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, anxiety and depression often report significant nausea that may be associated with delayed gastric emptying. Medications and metabolic disorders. Drugs evoke vomiting by action on the stomach, analgesics, erythromycin, or area postma, opiates, anti-Parkinsonian drugs. Other emetogenic agents include antibiotics, cardiac antiarrhythmics, antihypertensives, oral hypoglycemics, antidepressants, selective serotonin and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, smoking cessation drugs, varenicline, nicotine, and contraceptives. Cancer chemotherapy causes vomiting that is acute, within hours of administration, delayed, after one or more days, or anticipatory. Acute emesis from highly emetogenic agents, 
For example, cisplatin is mediated by 5-HT3 pathways, whereas delayed emesis is less dependent on 5-HT3 mechanisms. Anticipatory nausea may respond to anxiolytic therapy rather than antimatics. Metabolic disorders elicit nausea and vomiting. Pregnancy is the most prevalent endocrinologic cause, and nausea affects 70% of women in the first trimester. Hyperemesis gravidarum is a severe form of nausea of pregnancy that produces significant fluid loss and electrolyte disturbances. Uremia, ketoacidosis, adrenal insufficiency, and parathyroid and thyroid disease are other metabolic etiologies. Circulating toxins evoke emesis via effects on the area postroma. Endogenous toxins are generated in fulminant liver failure, whereas exogenous enterotoxins may be produced by enteric bacterial infection. Ethanol intoxication is a common toxic etiology of nausea and vomiting. Approach to the patient. Nausea and vomiting. History and physical examination. The history helps define the etiology of nausea and vomiting. Drugs, toxins, and infections often cause acute symptoms, whereas established illnesses evoke chronic complaints. Gastroparesis and pyloric obstruction elicit vomiting within an hour of eating. Emesis from intestinal blockage occurs later. Vomiting occurring within minutes of meal consumption prompts consideration of rumination syndrome. With severe gastric emptying delays, the vomitus may contain food residue ingested hours or days before. Hematemesis raises suspicion of an ulcer, malignancy, or mallory vice tear. Feculent emesis is noted with distal intestinal or colonic obstruction. Bilious vomiting excludes gastric obstruction, whereas emesis of undigested food is consistent with a Zenka's diverticulum or achalasia. Vomiting can relieve abdominal pain from a bowel obstruction, but has no effect in pancreatitis or cholecystitis. Profound weight loss raises concern about malignancy or obstruction. Fevers suggest inflammation. An intracranial source is considered if there are headaches or visual field changes. Vertigo. Or tinnitus indicates labyrinthine disease. The physical examination complements the history. Orthostatic hypertension and reduced skin turgor indicate intravascular fluid loss. Pulmonary abnormalities raise concern for aspiration of vomitus. Abdominal auscultation may reveal absent bowel sounds with ileus. High-pitched rushes suggest bowel obstruction, whereas a succussion splash upon abrupt lateral movement of the patient is found with gastroparesis or pyloric obstruction. Tenderness or involuntary guarding raises suspicion of inflammation, whereas fecal blood suggests mucosal injury from ulcer, ischemia, or tumor. Neurologic disease presents with papilledema, visual field loss, or focal neural abnormalities. Neoplasm is suggested by palpation of masses or adenopathy. Diagnostic testing. For intractable symptoms or an elusive diagnosis. Selected screening tests can direct clinical care. Electrolyte replacement is indicated for hypokalemia or metabolic alkalosis. Iron deficiency anemia mandates a search for mucosal injury. Pancreatic or biliary disease is indicated by abnormal pancreatic or liver biochemistries, whereas endocrinologic, rheumatologic, or paraneoplastic etiologies are suggested by hormone or serologic abnormalities. If bowel obstruction is suspected, supine and upright abdominal radiographs may show intestinal air fluid levels with reduced colonic air. Ileus is characterized by diffusely dilated air-filled bowel loops. Anatomic studies may be indicated if initial testing is non-diagnostic. Upper endoscopy detects ulcers, malignancy, and retain gastric food residue in gastroparesis. Small bowel barium radiography or computed tomography CT, diagnoses partial bowel obstruction. Colonoscopy or contrast enema radiography detects colonic obstruction. Ultrasound or CT defines intraperitoneal inflammation, CT and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, enterography provide superior definition of inflammation in Crohn's disease.
CT or MRI of the head can delineate intracranial disease. Mesenteric angiography, CT, or MRI is useful for suspected ischemia. Gastrointestinal motility testing may detect an underlying motor disorder when anatomic abnormalities are absent. Gastroparesis commonly is diagnosed by gastric scintigraphy, by which emptying of a radio-labeled meal is measured. Isotropic breath tests and wireless motility capsule methods are alternative tests to define gastroparesis in different regions of the world. Intestinal pseudobstruction often is suggested by abnormal barium transit and luminal dilation on small bowel contrast radiography. Delayed small bowel transit also may be detected by wireless capsule techniques. Small intestinal manometry can confirm the diagnosis and further characterize the motor abnormality as neuropathic or myopathic based on contractile patterns. Such investigation can obviate the need for surgical intestinal biopsy to evaluate for smooth muscle or neuronal degeneration. Combined ambulatory esophageal pH, impedance testing and high-resolution manometry can facilitate diagnosis of rumination syndrome. Treatment Nausea and vomiting General principles Therapy of vomiting is tailored to correcting remediable abnormalities if possible. Hospitalization is considered for severe dehydration, especially if oral fluid replenishment cannot be sustained. Once oral intake is tolerated, nutrients are restarted with low-fat liquids, because lipids delay gastric emptying. Foods high in indigestible residue are avoided because these prolong gastric retention. Controlling blood glucose in poorly controlled diabetics can reduce hospitalizations in gastroparesis. Antiemetic medications. The most commonly used antiemetic agents act on central nervous system sites. Table 54-2. Antihistamines like dimenhydrinate and mucleisin and anticholinergics like scopolamine act on labyrinthine pathways to treat motion sickness and inner ear disorders. Dopamine D2 antagonists treat emesis evoked by area postroma stimuli and are used for medication, toxic and metabolic etiologies. Dopamine antagonists cross the blood-brain barrier and cause anxiety, movement disorders, and hyperprolactinemic effects, galacteria, sexual dysfunction. Other classes exhibit antmetic properties. 5-HT3 antagonists such as ondansetron and granisetron can prevent postoperative vomiting, radiation therapy-induced symptoms, and cancer chemotherapy-induced emesis but also are used for other causes of emesis with limited evidence for efficacy. Tricyclic antidepressant agents provide symptomatic benefit in patients with chronic idiopathic nausea and functional vomiting as well as in long-standing diabetic patients with nausea and vomiting. Other antidepressants such as mirtazapine and olanzapine also may exhibit antmetic effects. Gastrointestinal motor stimulants Drugs that stimulate gastric emptying are used for gastroparesis, Table 54-2. Metoclopramide, a combined 5-HT4 agonist and D2 antagonist, is effective in gastroparesis, but antidopaminergic side effects, such as dystonias and mood and sleep disturbances, limit use in 25% of cases. Erythromycin increases gastroduodenal motility by action on receptors for motilin, an endogenous stimulant of fasting motor activity. Intravenous erythromycin is useful for in patients with refractory gastroparesis, but oral forms have some utility. Domperidun, a D2 antagonist not available in the United States, exhibits prokinetic and antimetic effects but does not cross into most brain regions, thus, Anxiety and dystonic reactions are a. The main side effects of domperidone relate to induction of hyperprolactinemia via effects on pituitary regions served by a porous blood-brain barrier. Refractory motility disorders pose significant challenges. Intestinal pseudobstruction may respond to the somatostatin analog octreotide, which induces propagative small intestinal motor complexes. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors such as pyridostigmine are also observed to benefit some patients with small bowel dysmotility.
Pyloric injections of botulinum toxin are reported in uncontrolled studies to reduce gastroparesis symptoms, but small controlled trials observe benefits no greater than sham treatments. Surgical pyloroplasty has improved symptoms in case series. Placing a feeding jejunostomy reduces hospitalizations and improves overall health in some patients with drug refractory gastroparesis. Postvagotomy gastroparesis may improve with near total gastric resection. Similar operations are now being tried for other gastroparesis etiologies. Implanted gastric electrical stimulators may reduce symptoms, enhance nutrition, improve quality of life, and decrease health care expenditures in medication refractory gastroparesis, but small controlled trials do not report convincing benefits. Safety Considerations Safety concerns about selected antimatics have been emphasized. Centrally acting antidopaminergics, especially metoclopramide, can cause irreversible movement disorders such as tardive dyskinesia, particularly in older patients. This complication should be carefully explained and documented in the medical record. Some agents with antimatic properties including domperidone, erythromycin, tricyclics, and 5-HT3 antagonists can induce dangerous cardiac rhythm disturbances, especially in those with QTC interval prolongation on electrocardiography ECG. Surveillance ECG testing has been advocated for some of these agents. Selected clinical settings. Some cancer chemotherapies are intensely emetogenic. CHAP 103E Combining a 5-HT3 antagonist, an NK1 antagonist, and a glucocorticoid provides significant control of both acute and delayed vomiting after highly emetogenic chemotherapy. Unlike other drugs in the same class, the 5-HT3 antagonist Palonistron exhibits efficacy at preventing delayed chemotherapy-induced vomiting. Benzodiazepines such as lorazepam can reduce anticipatory nausea and vomiting. Miscellaneous therapies with benefit in chemotherapy-induced emesis include cannabinoids, olanzapine, and alternative therapies like ginger. Most antmatic regimens produce greater reductions in vomiting than in nausea. Clinicians should exercise caution in managing pregnant patients with nausea. Studies of the teratogenic effects of antmatic agents provide conflicting results. Few controlled trials have been performed in nausea of pregnancy. Antihistamines such as meclizine and doxlimin, antidopaminergics such as procloparazine, and antizeratinergics such as ondansetron demonstrate limited efficacy. Some obstetricians offer alternative therapies such as pyridoxine, acupressure, or ginger. Managing cyclic vomiting syndrome is a challenge. Prophylaxis with tricyclic antidepressants, cyproheptadine, or beta-adrenoceptor antagonists can reduce the severity and frequency of attacks. Intravenous 5-HT3 antagonists combined with the sedating effects of a benzodiazepine like lorazepam are a mainstay of treatment of acute flares. Small studies report benefits with antimigraine agents, including the 5-HT1 agonist Zumatriptan as well as selected anticonvulsants such as zonisamide and levitiorastam. Indigestion Mechanisms The most common causes of indigestion are gastroesophageal reflux and functional dyspepsia. Other cases are a consequence of organic illness. Gastroesophageal reflux Gastroesophageal reflux results from many physiologic defects. Reduced lower esophageal sphincter, lay tone contributes to reflux in sclerodema and pregnancy and may be a factor in some patients without systemic illness. Others exhibit frequent transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations, tl as, that cause bathing of the esophagus by acid or non-acidic fluid. Overeating and aerophagia override the barrier function of the lower esophageal sphincter whereas reductions in esophageal body motility or salivary secretion prolong fluid exposure. Increased intragastric pressure promotes gastroesophageal reflux in obesity. The role of hiatal hernias is controversial, most reflux patients have hiatal hernias, 
but most with hiatal hernias do not have excess heartburn. Gastric motor dysfunction. Disturbed gastric motility may contribute to gastroesophageal reflux in up to one-third of cases. Delayed gastric emptying is also found in about 30% of functional dyspeptics. Conversely, some dyspeptics exhibit rapid gastric emptying. The relation of these defects to symptom induction is uncertain. Studies show poor correlation between symptom severity and degrees of motor dysfunction. Impaired gastric fundus relaxation after eating, that is, accommodation, may underlie selected dyspeptic symptoms like bloating, nausea, and early satiety in about 40% of patients. Visceral afferent hypersensitivity. Disturbed gastric sensation is another pathogenic factor in functional dyspepsia. Visceral hypersensitivity was first reported in irritable bowel syndrome with demonstration of heightened perception of rectal balloon inflation without changes in compliance. Similarly, about 35% of dyspeptic patients note discomfort with fundic distension to lower pressures than healthy controls. Others with dyspepsia exhibit hypersensitivity to chemical stimulation with capsaicin or with acid or lipid exposure in the duodenum. Some individuals with functional heartburn without increased acid or non-acid reflux are believed to have heightened perception of normal esophageal pH and volume. Other factors. Helicobacter pylori has a clear etiologic role in peptic ulcer disease, but ulcers cause a minority of dyspepsia cases. Helicobacter pylori is a minor factor in the genesis of functional dyspepsia. Functional dyspepsia is associated with chronic fatigue, produces reduced physical and mental well-being, and is exacerbated by stress. Anxiety, depression, and somatization may have contributing roles in some cases. Functional MRI studies show increased activation of several brain regions, emphasizing contributions from central nervous system factors. Analgesics cause dyspepsia, whereas nitrates calcium channel blockers, theophylline, and progesterone promote gastroesophageal reflux. Other stimuli that induce reflux include ethanol, tobacco, and caffeine via lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Genetic factors may promote development of reflux and dyspepsia. Differential Diagnosis Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease GERD, is prevalent. Heartburn is reported once monthly by 40% of Americans and daily by 7 to 10%. Most cases of heartburn occur because of excess acid reflux, but reflux of non-acidic fluid produces similar symptoms. Alkaline reflux esophagitis produces GERD-like symptoms most often in patients who have had surgery for peptic ulcer disease. 10% of patients with heartburn exhibit normal esophageal acid exposure and no increase in non-acidic reflux, functional heartburn. Functional dyspepsia. Nearly 25% of the populace has dyspepsia at least 6 times yearly, but only 10 to 20% present to clinicians. Functional dyspepsia, the cause of symptoms in greater than 60% of dyspeptic patients is defined as greater or equal three months of bothersome postprandial fullness, early satiety, or epigastric pain or burning with symptom onset at least six months before diagnosis in the absence of organic cause. Functional dyspepsia is subdivided into postprandial distress syndrome, characterized by meal-induced fullness, early satiety, and discomfort, and epigastric pain syndrome which presents with epigastric burning pain unrelated to meals. Most cases follow a benign course, but some with helicobacter pylori infection or on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, develop ulcers. As with idiopathic gastroparesis, some cases of functional dyspepsia result from prior infection. Ulcer disease. In most gastroesophageal reflux disease patients, there is no destruction of the esophagus. However, 5% develop esophageal ulcers, and some form strictures. Symptoms cannot distinguish non-erosive from erosive or ulcerative esophagitis. A minority of cases of dyspepsia stem from gastric or duodenal ulcers. 
The most common causes of ulcer disease are Helicobacter pylori infection and use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Other rare causes of gastroduodenal ulcers include Crohn's disease, Chapter 351, and Solinorelicent syndrome, Chapter 348, resulting from gastrin overproduction by an endocrine tumor. Malignancy Dyspeptic patients often seek care because of fear of cancer, but few cases result from malignancy. Esophageal squamous cell carcinoma occurs most often with long-standing tobacco or ethanol intake. Other risks include prior caustic ingestion, brachialasia, and the hereditary disorder tylosis. Esophageal adenocarcinoma usually complicates prolonged acid reflux. 8 to 20 percent of GERD patients exhibit esophageal intestinal metaplasia, termed Barrett's metaplasia, a condition that predisposes to esophageal adenocarcinoma, Chapter 109. Gastric malignancies include adenocarcinoma, which is prevalent in certain Asian societies, and lymphoma. Other causes Opportunistic fungal or viral esophageal infections may produce heartburn but more often cause adenophagia. Other causes of esophageal inflammation include eosinophilic esophagitis and pilesophagitis. Biliary colic is in the differential diagnosis of unexplained upper abdominal pain. But most patients with biliary colic report discrete acute episodes of right upper quadrant or epigastric pain rather than the chronic burning, discomfort, and fullness of dyspepsia. 20% of patients with gastroparesis report a predominance of pain or discomfort rather than nausea and vomiting. Intestinal lactase deficiency as a cause of gas, bloating, and discomfort occurs in 15 to 25 percent of whites of northern European descent but is more common in blacks and Asians. Intolerance of other carbohydrates, for example, fructose, sorbitol, produces similar symptoms. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth may cause dyspepsia, often associated with bowel dysfunction, distension, and malabsorption. Eosinophilic infiltration of the duodenal mucosa is described in some dyspeptics, particularly with postprandial distress syndrome. Celiac disease, pancreatic disease, chronic pancreatitis, malignancy, hepatocellular carcinoma, menetrias disease, infiltrative diseases, sarcoidosis, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, mesenteric ischemia, thyroid and parathyroid disease and abdominal wall strain cause dyspepsia. Gluten sensitivity in the absence of celiac disease is reported to evoke unexplained upper abdominal symptoms. Extraperitoneal etiologies of indigestion include congestive heart failure and tuberculosis. Approach to the patient. Indigestion. History and physical examination. Care of the indigestion patient requires a thorough interview. Gastroesophageal reflux disease classically produces heartburn, a substantial warmth that moves toward the neck. Heartburn often is exacerbated by meals and may awaken the patient. Associated symptoms include regurgitation of acid or non-acidic fluid and water brash, the reflex release of salty salivary secretions into the mouth. Atypical symptoms include pharyngitis, asthma, cough, bronchitis, hoarseness, and chest pain that mimics angina. Some patients with acid reflux on esophageal pH testing do not report heartburn, but note abdominal pain or other symptoms. Dyspeptic patients typically report symptoms referable to the upper abdomen that may be meal-related, as with postprandial distress syndrome, or independent of food ingestion, as in epigastric pain syndrome. Functional dyspepsia overlaps with other disorders including gastroesophageal reflux disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and idiopathic gastroparesis. The physical exam with gastroesophageal reflux disease and functional dyspepsia usually is normal. In atypical gastroesophageal reflux disease, pharyngeal erythema and wheezing may be noted. Recurrent acid regurgitation may cause poor dentition. Dyspeptics may exhibit epigastric tenderness or distension. Discriminating functional and organic causes of indigestion mandates excluding certain historic and exam features. 
Adenophagia suggests esophageal infection. Dysphagia is concerning for a benign or malignant esophageal blockage. Other alarm features include unexplained weight loss, recurrent vomiting, occult or gross bleeding, jaundice, palpable mass or adenopathy, and a family history of gastrointestinal neoplasm. Diagnostic Testing because indigestion is prevalent and most cases result from gastroesophageal reflux disease or functional dyspepsia, a general principle is to perform only limited and directed diagnostic testing of selected individuals. Once alarm factors are excluded, Table 54-3, patients with typical gastroesophageal reflux disease do not need further evaluation and are treated empirically. Upper endoscopy is indicated to exclude mucosal injury in cases with atypical symptoms, symptoms unresponsive to acid suppression, or alarm factors. For heartburn greater than 5 years in duration, especially in patients greater than 50 years old, endoscopy is advocated to screen for Barrett's metaplasia. The benefits and cost-effectiveness of this approach have not been validated in controlled studies. Ambulatory esophageal pH testing using a catheter method or a wireless capsule endoscopically attached to the esophageal wall is considered for drug refractory symptoms and atypical symptoms like unexplained chest pain. High resolution esophageal manometry is ordered when surgical treatment of gastroesophageal reflux disease is considered. A low lower esophageal sphincter pressure predicts failure of drug therapy and provides a rationale to proceed to surgery. Poor esophageal body peristalsis raises concern about postoperative dysphagia and directs the choice of surgical technique. Non-acidic reflux may be detected by combined esophageal impedance pH testing in medication unresponsive patients. Upper endoscopy is recommended as the initial test in patients with unexplained dyspepsia who are more than 55 years old or who have alarm factors because of the purported elevated risks of malignancy and ulcer in these groups. However, endoscopic findings in unexplained dyspepsia include erosive esophagitis in 13%, peptic ulcer in 8%, and gastric or esophageal malignancy in only 0.3%. Management of patients less than 55 years old without alarm factors depends on the local prevalence of Helicobacter pylori infection. In regions with low Helicobacter pylori prevalence, less than 10%, a four-week trial of an acid-suppressing medication such as a proton pump inhibitor, PPI, is recommended. If this fails, a test and treat approach is most commonly applied. Helicobacter pylori status is determined with urea breath testing, stool antigen measurement, or blood serology testing. Those who are helicobacter pylori positive are given therapy to eradicate the infection. If symptoms resolve on either regimen, no further intervention is required. For patients in areas with high helicobacter pylori prevalence, greater than 10%, an initial test and treat approach is advocated with a subsequent trial of an acid-suppressing regimen offered for those in whom Helicobacter pylori treatment fails or for those who are negative for the infection. In each of these patient subsets, upper endoscopy is reserved for those whose symptoms fail to respond to therapy. Further testing is indicated in some settings. If bleeding is noted, a blood count can exclude anemia. Thyroid chemistries or calcium levels screen for metabolic disease whereas specific serologies may suggest celiac disease. Pancreatic and liver chemistries are obtained for possible pancreatic or biliary causes. Ultrasound, CT, or MRI is performed if abnormalities are found. Gastric emptying testing is considered to exclude gastroparesis for dyspeptic symptoms that resemble postprandial distress when drug therapy fails and in some GERD patients especially if surgical intervention is an option. Breath testing after carbohydrate ingestion detects lactase deficiency, intolerance to other carbohydrates, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Treatment Indigestion General Principles For mild indigestion, reassurance that a careful evaluation revealed no serious organic disease may be the only intervention needed. 
Drugs that cause gastroesophageal reflux or dyspepsia should be stopped, if possible. Patients with GERD should limit ethanol, caffeine, chocolate, and tobacco use due to their effects on the lower esophageal sphincter. Other measures in GERD include ingesting a low-fat diet, avoiding snacks before bedtime, and elevating the head of the bed. Patients with functional dyspepsia also may be advised to reduce intake of fat, spicy foods, caffeine, and alcohol. Specific therapies for organic disease should be offered when possible. Surgery is appropriate for biliary colic, whereas diet changes are indicated for lactase deficiency or celiac disease. Peptic ulcers may be cured by specific medical regimens. However, because most indigestion is caused by GERD or functional dyspepsia, medications that reduce gastric acid, modulate motility, or blunt gastric sensitivity are used. Acid suppressing or neutralizing medications. Drugs that reduce or neutralize gastric acid are often prescribed for GERD. Histamine H2 antagonists like cimetidin, ranitidin, famotidin, and nizatidin are useful in mild to moderate GERD. For severe symptoms or for many cases of erosive or ulcerative esophagitis, proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole, lanzaprazole, rabeprazole, pantoprazole, esomeprazole, or dexlanzaprazole are needed. These drugs inhibit gastric H+, K+, ATPase and are more potent than H2 antagonists. Up to one-third of GERD patients do not respond to standard proton pump inhibitor doses, one-third of these patients have non-acidic reflux, whereas 10% have persistent acid-related disease. Furthermore, heartburn typically responds better to proton pump inhibitor therapy than regurgitation or atypical GERD symptoms. Some individuals respond to doubling of the proton pump inhibitor dose or adding an H2 antagonist at bedtime. Infrequent complications of long-term proton pump inhibitor therapy include infection, diarrhea, from Clostridium difficile infection or microscopic colitis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, nutrient deficiency, vitamin B12, iron, calcium, hypomanzemia, bone demineralization, interstitial nephritis, and impaired medication absorption, for example, clopidogrel. Many patients started on a proton pump inhibitor can be stepped down to an H2 antagonist or be switched to an on-demand schedule. Acid suppressing drugs are also effective in selected patients with functional dyspepsia. A meta-analysis of eight controlled trials calculated a risk ratio of 0.86, with a 95% confidence interval of 0.78 to 0.95 favoring proton pump inhibitor therapy over placebo. H2 antagonists also reportedly improve symptoms in functional dyspepsia, however, findings of trials of this drug class likely are influenced by inclusion of large numbers of GERD patients. Antacids are useful for short-term control of mild GERD but have less benefit in severe cases unless given at high doses that cause side effects diarrhea and constipation with magnesium and aluminum containing agents, respectively. Alginic acid combined with antacids forms a floating barrier to reflux in patients with upright symptoms. Sucralfate, a salt of aluminum hydroxide and sucrose octasulfate that buffers acid and binds pepsin in bile salts, shows efficacy in GERD similar to H2 antagonists. Helicobacter pylori eradication Helicobacter pylori eradication is definitively indicated only for peptic ulcer and mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue gastric lymphoma. The utility of eradication therapy in functional dyspepsia is limited, although some cases, particularly with the epigastric pain syndrome subtype, relate to this infection. A meta-analysis of 18 controlled trials calculated a relative risk reduction of 10% with a 95% confidence interval of 6 to 14%, favoring helicobacter pylori eradication over placebo. Most drug combinations, chapters 188 and 348, include 10 to 14 days of a proton pump inhibitor or bismuth subsalicylate in concert with two antibiotics.
Helicobacter pylori infection is associated with reduced prevalence of GERD, especially in the elderly. However, eradication of the infection does not worsen GERD symptoms. No consensus recommendations regarding Helicobacter pylori eradication in GERD patients have been offered. Agents that modify gastrointestinal motor activity. Prokinetics like metoclopramide, erythromycin, and domperidone have limited utility in GERD. The gamma aminobutyric acid type B, GABA B, agonist baclofen reduces esophageal exposure to acid and non-acidic fluids by reducing transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations, TL as, by 40%. This drug is proposed for refractory acid and non-acid reflux. Several studies have promoted the efficacy of motor-stimulating drugs in functional dyspepsia, but publication bias and small sample sizes raise questions about reported benefits of these agents. Some clinicians suggest that patients with the postprandial distress subtype may respond preferentially to prokinetic drugs. The 5-HT1 agonist buspirone may improve some functional dyspepsia symptoms by enhancing meal-induced gastric accommodation. Acolchamide promotes gastric emptying and augments accommodation by enhancing gastrococetylcholine release via muscarinic receptor antagonism and acetylcholinesterase inhibition. This agent is approved for functional dyspepsia in Japan and is in testing elsewhere. Other options Anti-reflux surgery, fund application, to increase lower esophageal sphincter pressure may be offered to GERD patients who are young and require lifelong therapy, have typical heartburn and regurgitation, are responsive to proton pump inhibitors, and show evidence of acid reflux on pH monitoring. Surgery also is effective for some cases of non-acidic reflux. Individuals who respond less well to fund application include those with atypical symptoms or who have esophageal body motor disturbances. Dysphagia, gas bloat syndrome, and gastroparesis are long-term complications of these procedures. About 60% develop recurrent GERD symptoms over time. The utility and safety of endoscopic therapies, radiofrequency ablation, transural incisionless fund application, to enhance gastroesophageal barrier function have unproved durable benefits for refractory GERD. Some patients with functional heartburn and functional dyspepsia refractory to standard therapies may respond to antidepressants in tricyclic and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor classes, although studies are limited. Their mechanism of action may involve blunting of visceral pain processing in the brain. Gas and bloating are among the most troubling symptoms in some patients with indigestion and can be difficult to treat. Dietary exclusion of gas-producing foods such as legumes and use of symphagone or activated charcoal provide benefits in some cases. Low FODMAP, fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyol, diets and therapies to modify gut flora, non-absorbable antibiotics, probiotics. Reduce gaseous symptoms in some irritable bowel syndrome patients. The utility of low fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyol diets, antibiotics, and probiotics in functional dyspepsia is unproven. Herbal remedies such as STW5, Iberogust, a mixture of nine herbal agents, are useful in some dyspeptic patients. Psychological treatments, for example, Behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, may be offered for refractory functional dyspepsia, but no convincing data confirm their efficacy.